Have you ever been told that you have degenerative disc disease? And what does that even mean? Is it really a disease? Maybe you've had an MRI of your lower back and you see something on the report that says you have modic end plate changes. What does that mean? Yesterday, I presented the case of a 37-year-old woman who came to my office for a second opinion on lower back pain she's had since she was pregnant over 15 years ago. It's an aching lower back pain in the dead center of her lower back that's worse with movement and better with rest. And it seemingly has gotten worse over the past several years. Now, she's tried chiropractic treatment, physical therapy, medications, and she's even resorted to injections over the years that have given her some type of relief, but nothing really makes it go away. In fact, she saw a spine surgeon who told her that there was nothing that he could do for her, and she began to think that maybe it was all in her head. Do you know how many young women I see with this same story? Here is the MRI that was done on her lower back, and what we're seeing here is a degenerative disc at L5 S1 with modic end plate changes. Modic end plate changes? So each one of these vertebral bodies or squares are the bones in our spine. And then in between the bones in our spine is the disc or the squishy material that helps provide movement to our spine. And on her MRI, we see this black disc that is worn out at L5-S1. And we see surrounding in the bones above and below this white change in the bone. What we also see is that this disc at L5-S1 has also lost some height. So it's began to degenerate over time. In my videos in the past, I've had many of you guys in the comments section ask me to explain modic end plate changes. So here it goes. I explained the disc to my patients. It's kind of like a jelly donut. You have a hard outer coating and the inside is made of a high water content cartilage. And if you injure that disc over time, you can start to get deterioration and loss of the hydration of that disc. So it will collapse over time. When that happens in some people, they'll get this modic end plate change, which is basically edema in the bone above and below that damaged disc. It happens because of repetitive microtrauma to the bone because the disc isn't normal. Now there's three main types of modic end plate changes and it describes the phenomenon over time. In type one, you'll get inflammation and edema of the bone marrow within the bone. And then over time, because of that devascularization from the ongoing damage, you'll get fatty infiltration of the bone marrow. And then even after a longer period of time, you'll start to see sclerosis or hardening of that bone related to the deterioration of the disc. I describe it to my patients like that bone on bone rubbing from the damaged disc will cause swelling in the bone and the reactive changes that happen because of that. I want to stress that modic end plate changes don't always cause pain. And that's a trouble that we see in spine surgery is that not always what we see on imaging can correlate to the patient's symptoms, meaning not everybody that has modic changes will have pain at all. So how do we know? There's one thing that I've learned after being a spine surgeon for over 11 years is that patient manifests their pain very differently, meaning a patient with a pretty normal MRI can have a lot of pain and a patient with a horrible looking MRI sometimes comes in and has no pain. So how do you know what to do? You listen to the patient. You do a thorough history, physical examination, review of their imaging studies, and try to put everything together. Sometimes it's not always perfect. That's why a lot of times you've probably heard people that have had unsuccessful back surgery is because they didn't have the right surgery for the right diagnosis. This is not an easy profession. With all that being said, let me explain what I did for this patient. I can guarantee you that if you talk to five other spine surgeons, you may get five other answers. First off, I took a detailed history. Her pain began during pregnancy when she was about eight months pregnant and she was getting the nursery ready for the baby. She bent over, picked up something heavy, and had acute onset of lower back pain. That's where her pain began. And over time, she just had gradual worsening of that same pain. What does being pregnant have anything to do with it? When you're pregnant, you have a very weak core and pelvic floor because of the baby being physically inside of you. Not only that, you have increased weight, 
decrease biomechanical ergonomics because you're trying to adapt to walking with this large abdomen and it can lead to injuries to the spine. You even get hormonal changes that can give you ligamentous laxity and can make you more predisposed to injuring your back. It's not always disc related pain because you can certainly have a multitude of other problems with your lower back during pregnancy with one of the most common being sacroiliac joint pain. But that's not what she had. She had a biomechanical pain that isolated to her lower back in the midline over L5 and S1. And after talking about her symptoms when she had injections in the L5 S1 area, those are the ones that gave her the most relief. But the relief was only temporary. Over time, what I pieced together is that injury to her L5 S1 degenerated over time contributing to her ongoing pain. I also did a thorough review of her imaging. She had normal looking facet joints, which are a part of the motion segment of the spine, as well as no sign of pars fractures or stress fractures in her lower back. So I felt quite confident that her pain was isolated to her L5 S1, also called discogenic back pain. Data on discogenic back pain is not black and white. And that's why you'll find a lot of spine surgeons that actually don't believe in this diagnosis and don't offer treatment to some patients. My personal opinion is that it is a real diagnosis. It takes a keen eye and ear to listen to the patient and help correlate all the symptoms together to ensure that that disc is responsible for that pain. After reviewing all of her imaging history and all the conservative treatment options that she's tried and failed over the years, I felt quite confident that her pain isolated to the disc of L5 and S1. In any patient, young or old, that's seeking an opinion for back surgery, it's important to realize what can be offered and what that may mean for you long term. So many different things that we do in spine surgery, from minimally invasive to maximally invasive options, to decompression, to fusions, to disc replacement, to you name it, that's probably out there. There's even something for modic in plate changes, which some of you guys mentioned in the comment section called the intercept procedure, where we can go in, burn the nerve supplying the bone to help with this pain. Data on that procedure was suggest that 30 to 40% of people at one year will be pain free, but in my mind, that means 60 to 70% of people will still have pain. What did I do? We discussed all of her treatment options, and I recommended that we consider performing a lumbar disc replacement, basically where we remove the bad disc and replace it with a new disc, which will preserve the mobility of her spine. The procedure where we go in through a C-section type incision on the abdomen, we remove the offending bad disc and replace it with an implant that maintains the motion of the spine. This procedure takes about an hour, and you can go home the next day even noted as soon as she woke up from surgery that her pain was markedly improved despite the surgical pain. I want to stress the importance of you guys understanding that not every diagnosis is the same and not all treatment options are the same. That's why it's so important to go to a physician that listens to understand what's wrong with you and to present all the options on the table. Not everybody with motive in plate changes like her need a disc replacement. That's what makes back surgery extremely challenging. Here's her post-operative x-ray showing the implant and she has been pain-free for two years. Another case of patient-focused and compassionate care. Stay tuned next week and I'll go through another case. If I can impart one detail, make sure that you're being heard.